Hello, and welcome to the Movie Universe. I'm your host, Movie Fan. Today, I will be doing something very special. I will be talking about Mighty Morphin Power Rangers the Movie. Now, I have talked about this before, but today is a very special day, because today is the 25th anniversary of this movie. So, of course, I have to talk about it. However, this time, I'm going to be doing something a bit more than just explaining the movie. Because we all know what it's about. It's just another chapter into the Power Rangers lore where an evil being named Ivan Ooze is released. He destroys the command center and almost destroys Zordon. The Rangers go to a distant planet named Phaedos to get the great power they need to save him. And of course, before they save Zordon, they stop Ivan Ooze and his ectomorphicons. Now, since we already know the details of the movie, I don't need to re-explain it. So for this special day, I'm going to be talking more about what happened behind the scenes. And boy, we have got a lot to talk about with that. As we all know, Power Rangers became a worldwide phenomenon overnight. In fact, the minute that Power Rangers became famous, Fox immediately went to Saban and suggested they try to make a movie. Saban, of course, jumped on the idea, and they got to work immediately. Of course, as we all know, it takes more than one year to make a movie, so it took a couple years before it premiered. And during that time, it took a lot of planning, and obviously they chose to go between Season 2 and 3 due to quite a few factors. One, Jason Trini and Zack left the show, and two, they wanted to try to do it between both seasons. That way they could have something that's completely different, as well as something that would gear up the fans for Season 3 especially given the fact that they had a $20 million budget to work with. In fact, the producer actually said that they had to raise it to $20 million because originally they didn't have enough of a budget to do it. As we already know, what made this movie work was the cast, and that was because they used the cast from Mighty Morphin Power Rangers. Because, let's get real, no one could fill their shoes. I have always said that it was the cast that brought this series to life. And just like with the series, they bring the movie to life as well. There isn't a Power Ranger fan alive who doesn't know Tommy, the White Ranger, or Kimberly, the beautiful Pink Ranger, or Billy, the brilliant Blue Ranger. And of course, we cannot forget Rocky, Adam, and Aisha, who most people would remember as the second Black, Yellow, and Red Rangers. But in the series, they did lend a lot to the show. Rocky was tough, he was smart, and a brilliant tacticianer when things got bad. Adam proved to be a voracious fighter who would do anything he could to help his friends. And Aisha. She was pretty, she was cunning, and she had some mean fighting skills. And because these characters were so well established, they had to use them for the movie. As we all remember, this movie premiered between Season 2 and Season 3. And quite honestly, I think it's a more epic chapter into how they gained their ninja powers and their ninja zords compared to the series. I can understand why they had to go through with that first episode of Season 3 so they could get ninja involved, but still, I think this one's better. Because unlike the series, this was filmed on a grand scale. As all Power Rangers fans remember, there was only like a few select places that you saw the school, the youth center, and a lot of parks. Whereas for the movie, we are seeing an entire city here. And believe it or not, this footage was actually shot in Australia. And here's an interesting fact for you. While they were shooting this movie, they had to shoot a few episodes of Mighty Morphin Power Rangers in Australia at that time. Why did they do this? It's quite simple. They did this so they could concentrate on both the series and the movie. It saved both companies a lot of money because they were all shot in one place and they didn't have to go to California to shoot the series. Meanwhile, go back to Australia just to shoot the Angel Grove scenes for the movie. You might actually remember there was one episode where they go to Australia. And I'll give you one guess why they chose that location for that episode. Now that's what you call killing two birds with one stone. But of course, in order to make this movie, they had to do more than just bring in the original cast. Because in order for this epic tale to be told, they had to bring in two new characters, Dulcia and Ivan Ooze. There was actually a third one, Mordant, but he has little to nothing to do with this movie. In fact, he is the biggest disappointment in this whole entire picture. Because in the series, he never existed! And it's always been a mystery to me as to why they never chose Squat or Babu to make an appearance instead of this guy. And try this for a laugh. In the comic books, they tried claiming that he was Skoldar's distant cousin. But getting past that loser, Dulcia and Ivan Ooze, 
they were two key characters in this whole story. Ivan Ooze being the brand new enemy of the Power Rangers, he's so evil that he imprisons Lord Zen and Rita after they released him. Played by Paul Freeman, he was perfect for this role. He played him absolutely beautifully. His wickedness and even his comedic moments still amaze me to this day. And Dulcia, she's a beautiful warrior with great martial arts skills, but she's also quite wise, a lot like Zordon. She doesn't have too big of a part in this role, but her part definitely lends a lot to the story. Because not only does she save them from the Tengu warriors, she advises them as to where they need to go to get the great power. And she even calls help from the sacred animals of the Ninjeti to guide them to the great power. She was played by Gabrielle Fitzpatrick, and she was perfect for this role. And the funny thing, she wasn't originally chosen to play Dulcia. She did try out for the role. The director, Brian Spicer, actually liked Gabrielle Fitzpatrick. He wanted to use her. But for some reason, the producers decided to go with Mariska Hargitay. You would know her better as Lieutenant Benson from Law Law & Order SVU. For reasons unknown to me, they chose her. However, her time was short-lived in this movie, because they did a whole training scene which was never used in the movie. In fact, nobody knew this existed until they started showing the footage on YouTube. And I know you're going to ask me why this scene was never used. Well, to put it simply, there was too much dialogue and not enough action. And let's not forget, Zordon was dying. They didn't have time to train to go get the great power. Don't forget, they came to this planet so they could get the great power to save Zordon. And time was not on their side. So to add in a training session makes absolutely no sense. When they decided to cut that whole scene, they cut Mariska out of the show and replaced her with Gabrielle Fitzpatrick. As I've already said, Gabrielle Fitzpatrick was perfect for her. She sounded wise, she was tough, she was gritty, and she was beautiful. Mariska Hargitay, she just didn't fit the bill. I've seen some of the footage, and she doesn't fit. I'm guessing that's why they replaced her with Gabrielle Fitzpatrick. The funny thing is, nobody seems to know why she was replaced. But I don't think it really matters, because they ended up choosing the right Dulcia in the end. But of course, Power Rangers would not be Power Rangers if they didn't have two things. The costumes and the Zords. The costumes, as we already know, were designed to look more like armor. And most importantly, the costumes looked just like they did in the series, with a few upgrades. The obvious being that they look like armor. They also added some color to the gloves and the boots. Even their holsters are their individual colors instead of them being all white. And one thing that most people never bother to talk about is the power coins that are imprinted on their chests, which is straight out of the toys. As we all remember with the original Power Rangers merchandise, which still continues to this day, they had the power coin emblem on their chest. They never had it in the series, but they added it here, which made it even more awesome. Of course, that was just when they morphed for the first time in the movie. After that, they get their ninja costumes, which were totally awesome. The look was traditional ninja, while at the same time they had their same colors and new coins on their chests, which were the sacred animals of the Ninjeti. I've always loved those ninja costumes. They were absolutely amazing. And of course, when they become Power Rangers once again, they got their old costumes back, but with new power coins, which were the sacred animals of the Ninjeti on their chest. Now, I know a lot of people have questioned that. I myself have kind of questioned it, too, because what a coincidence that they go to this planet to get this power, and yet the colors and the costumes looks are exactly the same. Is it questionable? Yeah, but let's get real. We wouldn't have wanted them to look any different. And then there's the Zords. Now, as we all know, they were made out of CGI, and this was the first time that anyone had ever done this. Well, here in America, anyway, because whenever Ninjor transforms in Season 3, that looks like CGI to me. But using CGI in the Power Rangers movie for the Zords, that was a really big deal. Like I already said, that had never been used before. Of course, that has gotten a lot of mixed reviews over the years. In fact, even back then it kind of did, because it was a real tradition that we had guys in costumes doing the Megazord scenes, which made it look so real. Because the costumes, they were very well done. They did the explosions at the right time. The movements are natural. And here we get some very cheap CGI. The movements are good, 
but a lot of it just doesn't really fit right because looking at the wolf sword's mouth it looks real jagged and messed up for some reason as well as the bear sword's mouth that doesn't look right at all and if you pay close attention to the scenes where they're in the cockpits of their individual swords they look great except for rockies for some reason we got this dome look which uh, makes me think of one of the windows of the millennium falcon looking at that that does not fit at all for the ape sword as i said before they made the zords and the ectomorphicons look real super shiny which was very distracting because when you look at the original megazord and all of them they never looked real shiny like that and the shininess does nothing but highlight how cheap the cgi really is and what really didn't help was when ninja megazord trans forms and the crane zord comes down and instead of getting a face like you did in season three ninja megazord's head looks like a bucket and that did not help at all because it made this zord laughable of all the things they could have done they could have put a face on it but no instead they make the head look like a big bucket but still they made it work it was actually a great scene watching the zords take on the ectomorphicons and then watching the ninja megazord take on ivan ooze which brings us to the coolest thing in this movie, and that would be the special effects. Now, cast, story, and good acting are always the most important parts in a movie. But when you're doing an action film like this, special effects really does help. For most of it, we all know what the special effects were. A mixture of practical and CGI. The CGI, of course, being the Zords and the Ectomorphicons as well as Ivan Ooze's transformations. And of course the practical effects, which are the costumes, that dinosaur looking creature, the command center, Lord Zen and Rita's home, Goldar and Mordant, and of course Alpha 5. However, it turns out there was a lot more going on with the special effects than we all first thought. Because it turns out they did not use just CGI and practical effects. They did a mixture of everything. Now, obviously, they used practical and CGI. That's no secret. But they also used a miniature city to simulate the explosions as well as the Megazord battle in Angel Grove. I did not realize that. I thought they actually shot this on location and, you know, just made the explosions happen and just edit it very carefully. But no, they just used a miniature city. They timed everything very carefully. They made the explosions happen. And, of course, they superimposed the Zords and the Ectomorphicons fighting in the middle of Angel Grove. And now that I think about it, that would explain the scene where Ninja Megazord is thrown right through that building. Because if you watch carefully, that is a real model of the Megazord being thrown through that window. And when they're on the planet Phaedos looking out into the jungle, it turns out that's just a screen right in front of them because there really was nothing there the image of Phaedos's jungle was added in during the editing process it's an old trick that Hollywood's used for the longest time especially when they were on a short budget in fact this technique's been around ever since the beginning you know it's funny knowing all this stuff and I never knew that back in the day that's one of the coolest things about special effects they can really fool you into thinking that there's something going on there that really isn't going on at all. That's one of the reasons why I love all these other techniques other than CGI. CGI has its good points, but it has been so overused that nothing's become real anymore. And unfortunately, it's become so blatantly obvious as to what it is that it's taken all the magic out of it. But let's get back on track. For the practical effects, we all know about the rock guardians that guard the great power. Those costumes were absolutely amazing. And I always did love their weapons. They were incredible. But I cannot undercut Ivan Ooze's look. He was one of the coolest looking monsters of that time. Sure, he was only for the movie, but still. His purple color, that chin beard, the weird crevices on his head, his cloak. Everything about him is absolutely awesome. And here's an interesting fact for you, which I'm sure no one's going to be surprised about. When Paul Freeman was in that costume, he could not sit down while wearing that costume at all. Oh, sure he does in one scene, but that chair was obviously designed for that scene alone, because... He could not sit down in a regular chair. And as you may have guessed, it took hours of work to get him made up. And speaking of which, his makeup was actually made out of full prosthetics, which they had to literally glue to his skin. And, uh, well, you can see the problem there, because his skin started to get all red and rashy a good lot of the time. 
So they had to go through his scenes very quickly. What also didn't help was they gave him high-heeled boots to make him a little taller, and he ended up spraining his ankle pretty badly that he had to go to the hospital. I'm sure there were times he regretted doing that part just because of this alone. But, you know, an actor's got to do what an actor's got to do. Of course, one thing I got to mention is the famous skydiving scene, as well as the rollerblading scene. When they're skydiving, I always thought those shots were a little too perfect. But, you know, with a good cameraman, they can look really awesome without too much trouble at all. And it wasn't too long ago that I found behind-the-scenes footage and pictures showing that they did all that in front of a green screen. I'm not complaining because it makes perfect sense. How else could they get those perfect shots and without the fear of somebody really getting hurt? In fact, only one incident happened with that famous skydiving scene, and that's with Karen Ashley. When she was doing that spin, she actually got sick and threw up. She did admit that some time back. And considering how that spin went, I don't blame her. Now that we talked about the skydiving scene, we're going to talk about the rollerblading scene. And I know what you're thinking. How does this fall into special effects? Well, believe it or not, it turns out every bit of this was actually shot on location, and most of the Power Rangers were actually rollerblading. Except one. And that was Jason David Frank. In the words of Karen Ashley during a special interview that happened shortly after the movie premiered, it turns out Jason cannot do it all because... He can't rollerblade. Because he couldn't do it, they had to bring in a stunt double to do it for him. And if you watch the footage closely, you are not getting a clear look at his face at all. If you ever wondered why, there's your answer. Because that's not him. That's a stunt double. And of course, to be fair, there are a lot of scenes in this movie that did require stunt doubles. So in a way, a stunt double does qualify as special effects. Because stunt doubles really make action scenes happen. And who could forget that dinosaur creature? Obviously, practical effects through and through. And it's very interesting how they brought that dinosaur to life. What they did was they hung a wire above and had a pulley system attached to the dinosaur itself where they could guide it to make it move forward. Essentially, it was just a very big puppet. You don't see special effects like this anymore. And I've often regarded this scene with the dinosaur as the last time that they ever used practical effects. Oh sure, there were a few other times they used practical effects down the road, but not like this. That's why I say that this is probably the last time they ever used this type of practical effects. But of course, as always, when you make a movie, there's bound to be a few screw-ups along the way. Now, normally I don't talk about this sort of thing because, you know, blooper reels or mistakes, they're a dime a dozen. And you know what? No movie's perfect. These things happen beyond anyone's control. But for the sake of the anniversary, I think that I need to talk about this. And believe it or not, there's not as many as you think. In fact... There are only five. The first one is a real easy one. During the battle of the Ectomorphicons and the Zords, Aisha's Bearzord is knocked against the building, and Rocky jumps on the Hornetron. It is at that moment where Aisha is saying, Whoa, I've been hit hard, that we see her power coin is missing out of her chest. Obviously, when they filmed this, the glue wore off and it just came out. Now, to be fair, I didn't pick up on this for the longest time because my tape, it's your standard quality of the 90s, and it happens so fast that you don't catch it. The only reason I caught it now is because I watched the DVD recently. The second mistake, believe it or not, was in the trailer for Mighty Morphin Power Rangers the movie. And I'm talking the famous four-minute trailer that you saw before you got to watch the Page Master movie on tape, the one that showed some behind-the-scenes footage and interviews with the cast members. Great trailer, one of my favorites. But believe it or not, during that trailer, there's a clip that goes on for a few seconds where you see Tommy, the White Ranger, in his Ninjetti uniform, diving into the water. That was a part from the training scene that was cut out. How that ended up on there, I don't know. And I find it interesting because, you know, they cut that scene out. And as far as I know, it's never been included in any of the DVDs or even the Blu-rays. The third mistake happens when they destroy the Scorpiotron. Adam's got it by the throat. Billy's got it by the tail. The tail rips off and Billy goes flying in the air and oozes spraying all over the place. Then Tommy shows up with his falcon sword and fires his rockets. But during that scene, we get a moment where the Scorpiotron is looking up in the sky with that oh crap look, and the tail is back! Yeah, the severed part of the tail is actually back! Now, how do you suppose that happened? Which, of course, brings us to our fourth mistake, the Megazord transformation sequence. 
it's going real great. You're seeing the frog zord become the legs, the ape zord and the wolf zord become the arms, while the bear zord is the torso. And while you're seeing the arms attached to the torso, the head is already on. And then the crane zord comes in and the head is on. I wonder how that happened. How does the head prematurely end up on there before it actually gets on there? Yes, I know, I'm being very sarcastic, but it's just too good to pass up. I mean, it's silly moments like this you can't help but make jokes about. And now we come to mistake number five, which is so huge, I had to save this one for last. And that would be when the Rangers battle the Rock Guardians. Now, it's not the whole thing, but there are quite a few inconsistencies that happen during this battle. For instance, there's a scene where the Guardian that has that weird spiky sword is after Rocky. Then all of a sudden, that same Guardian is after Aisha within a second of each other. And then after a few awesome scenes, we go back to that Guardian with the sword, still after Aisha, and he's got her stuck in a little crevice there. Rocky kicks him, kicks away the sword, and that Guardian is just swinging his arms wildly after Rocky. And then we cut to a scene where that same Guardian is after Billy for a second there. Then all of a sudden, Adam is cornered by the Guardian with the spear and that one with the sword. Now, how, how do you suppose he got from way up there to down there so fast? Hmm. They take some wild swings at Adam. Billy throws him a line. Adam goes up. Billy goes down. The one guardian with the spear is cut in half by the one with the sword. And Billy says, talk about a splitting headache. Then all of a sudden, we're back to the guardian without the sword now, swinging wildly at Rocky. Then he picks up the spear and chucks it at him. Obviously, the scene where Rocky kicked that sword out of his hand, and then he's going after him, and then he grabs the spear and throws it, that should have been one whole single scene. But for some reason, they decided to break it up. And since he's the last guardian, all the rangers are gaining up on him. And then Tommy says this before he does his final kick. Ninjendi corkscrew kick! Obviously, that was left over from the training scene. The training scene that never happened. Back then, I couldn't understand why he said that, because they weren't training with Dulcia. But now that I know about the training scene that they cut out, now it makes sense. Even though that scene has been chopped up here and there, it's still awesome to watch, no matter what. Although, I am tempted to try to re-edit this to the way I think it was meant to be. But anyway, those are the five mistakes that happen in this movie. And that's actually not half bad, because I've seen a lot of films that have made huge mistakes. So huge, they're laughable. These mistakes, by comparison, are very minor. They're noticeable, but they're very minor. Of course, I'm sure quite a few of the fans will disagree with me that there are actually only five mistakes in the whole movie, because I'm sure a lot of people will say that there's a sixth one. And I think we all know what that is. The CGI Megazord. And I will not lie, a lot of the fans had a very good reason to hate this Megazord. First off, the CGI is obviously very cheap. And the second reason is because we were hoping for someone in a costume, which is traditional to Power Rangers. And yes, I'll admit, I would have preferred if it was a guy in a costume, but they wanted to try something new. In fact, they announced it way ahead of schedule that they were going to do this. And as I recall, a lot of people were very excited about the new CGI Megazord. Because up until that point, this had never been done before. Now sure, there's no denying that the CGI was very cheap. And the director did admit that he wanted to go for something better. But unfortunately, the budget was limited to $25 million. So this was the best they could do. And everyone always forgets that just because Jurassic Park was such a huge success with the CGI department, they think that that type of CG was cheap and easy to come by. And the truth is, no, it wasn't. That was very expensive and extremely time-consuming to try to create. Because everyone forgets that back then, to render this type of image takes hours, even days of work. Nowadays, it takes barely a few minutes, depending how good a software you got. But back then, that took hours to render. Now, I won't deny it's not the greatest CGI in the world. And yes, I have griped about a few issues, like the Megazord's head looks like a big bucket, which I've already complained about. And the teeth that are on the bear and the wolf zords, they don't look right at all. But you know what? I still love the CGI Megazord for what it is. It's original. It's unique. And it's pretty darn good work for that time. I would call it a first attempt at CGI for Power Rangers. It's not perfect, but it is good. And as I always say, it's not the special effects that make the movie. It's the cast and the story. 
The special effects are just a means to an end. Yes, the special effects can bring a movie to life, but if you don't have that good cast and plot and story and great acting, you got nothing. And that's the truth. Which reminds me of one important thing that I must bring up, and that is the music. As I've said before, music is one of the most essential things in movies that most of the time people don't talk about, unless it's a musical. Music is one of the things that makes a good fight scene more epic, and what makes a romantic scene even more, well, romantic. It pumps up the action and enhances the drama. That's what music does. And the music to this movie does just that, and more. When we do the skydiving scene, we're listening to the song Higher Ground done by the Red Hot Chili Peppers. And when we get the famous rollerblading scene, we're listening to the song Free Ride, which was done by Dan Hartman. And of course, who could forget the big fight scene between the Power Rangers and the Ooze Men, where you hear the song Are You Ready, done by Devo. That song was perfect for that scene. And I know a lot of people will definitely remember that they got the song Go Go Power Rangers. Of course, it was changed with a certain group entitled the Power Rangers Orchestra. It was cool, I cannot deny it, but I do prefer Ron Wasserman's version, because when he sings the whole song, it sounds awesome. When these guys do the whole song, not so awesome. It doesn't feel as epic as the original theme song does. The only time it really sounds awesome is when you're hearing them say, Go, go, Power Rangers! The rest of it, eh... Fortunately, all you hear in the movie is Go Go Power Rangers, not the rest of it. But to be fair, trying to compete with Ron Wasserman's creation is not an easy thing to do. In fact, I'm sure there's no one who can do it. And I know everyone remembers the famous fireworks scene where you hear the song Dreams done by Van Halen. Great way to finish that moment. It made that scene oh so epic. Just watching those fireworks go off and listening to the song Dreams, it just gives you that feeling of hope for the future, because the Power Rangers will always be there to save the day. It also gives a very tender moment where you see Tommy and Kimberly together looking at each other. That would be the scene where everyone thinks that they said something to each other, but they really didn't. Instead, they look lovingly in each other's eyes. And then they go back to cheering for the fireworks. This song pulls those two scenes together in a spectacular way. Of course, I cannot talk about the music without mentioning the song Trouble, done by the group Shampoo. This song appeared twice in the movie. First, while the kids were partying, not knowing that their parents were in danger. And second, when Goldar and Mordant realized that Lord Zed and Rita are back. And, well, they're in trouble, of course. Great song for those two scenes, because, you know, the first part... It's just filling in the time, and for the second part, because Goldar and Mordant are in big trouble. And I'll tell you a little fact here. The chorus is awesome, but the rest of the song really sucks. Trust me, if you ever look the song up, I'm sure you'll agree with me. Now, when it comes to Mighty Morphin Power Rangers the movie, we always praise the cast members, because just like in the series, they play their parts perfectly. But there are two unsung heroes in this. And they are screenwriter Arnie Olsen and director Brian Spicer. These two men are truly heroes in this whole movie because they kept it true to the series. And that is not an easy thing to do. And in fact, it turns out they were having problems with that because when Fox wanted to make Mighty Morphin Power Rangers the movie, there was a lot of debate between Fox and Saban as to what they wanted to go with because Saban wanted to keep the series going and he didn't want the movie to be something totally different. Meanwhile, Fox probably wanted to do stuff their way. And there was a lot of back and forth tension between all this. A lot of people were thinking this was going to turn out like Batman from 1989. Because as we all remember, when that came around, it was a completely different scenario from the Adam West versions. Because Batman 1989 was dark, a little more violent, stuff like that. And as we all remember, for the 1966 Adam West version of Batman, it was campy, it was funny. There were some punches and kicks. But it was nothing real serious. But to be fair, there was a huge gap between 1966 and 1989. So that was okay. But Power Rangers was still running. And Saban did not want them to completely change it. As a result, Fox hired Brian Spicer to direct the movie. And he proved to be the right choice in no time at all. Because he managed to get the story right in the middle. He made it to where Fox was happy. 
and Saban. He kept it true to the series, but yet just a little different. He made it a little more serious, like the fact that Zordon was dying, which was a very big deal, because such a thing had never happened on the series before. But as I said, it wasn't just Brian Spicer alone who pulled it off. It was screenwriter Arnie Olsen that really helped bring it all together. Because Arnie and Brian got together on this whole thing, and they came up with just the perfect script for the story. Brian's concept was to make it something like Wizard of Oz, where they end up in a foreign place and they have to go through obstacle after obstacle to get to their main goal. And here's an interesting fact for you. During that famous four-minute trailer where we see a little behind the scenes and we get interviews from the cast members, Amy Jo Johnson herself did say that the story was similar to The Wizard of Oz. You know, it's funny. I never picture Wizard of Oz associated with Power Rangers. Even after Amy Jo Johnson said that, I still couldn't see it. But now that I think about it, that's exactly what was going on. How the heck Brian Spicer and Arnie Olsen came up with this is beyond me, because I don't know anyone else who would have taken a concept like the Wizard of Oz and translated it into Power Rangers and actually make it work. There's no denying that these two deserve a lot of credit for pulling this off, especially for keeping it true to the series. Brian Spicer could have just done it Fox's way or however he felt like doing it, but no, he kept it to what it was meant to be. And that I must applaud him for. And I especially got to give a big hand to Arnie Olsen for this script. Because it was perfect. It was true to the characters. And it was a great story. It played out so perfectly that it still holds up even now. Of course, that's not to say that they didn't have a few problems down the road. Mostly Brian Spicer. Because being a director is not an easy job. Especially when you got producers to deal with. For instance, there was one part where they didn't have enough money to do all the great scenes that they wanted to do. So he went to the producers and did a little negotiating, and he managed to get that extra money they needed. The other problem was the training scene that never made it to the movie. Now, I've already talked about this, but what I didn't mention was the fact that Brian Spicer was the one who decided, no, there's too much dialogue here and not enough action, and that's not what Power Rangers is all about. Obviously, the man was familiar with Power Rangers enough to understand what the audience really wanted. That is completely unheard of because nobody ever does what the audience wants. They just usually do what they want to do. But he was smart enough to give the fans what they really wanted. I have never seen a director who would go to those kind of lengths to know what the fans really wanted out of this and to actually do it. That's my kind of director. And you know what? When Hasbro decides to do their little reboot, they should get him to direct it. He did it right once before, and I'm sure he could do it right again. And if Arnie Olsen isn't retired, they should get him in on it too. Because it was these two men that made this movie possible. These were the ones who gave the audience really what they wanted out of it character-wise and story-wise. And if we could get these two back together for the reboot, that would be great. We'll just have to wait and see what happens next. When the movie was finished, everyone was excited to see how the audience would react. Because Mighty Morphin Power Rangers the movie was going to premiere at the legendary Grumman Chinese Theater. And even better yet, the Rangers themselves were going to put their footprints and their handprints in some concrete. And as per tradition, before the movie premieres, the cast comes out of the limousines and walks the red carpet. They take pictures and they put their footprints and their handprints in the concrete. But they did not just do that alone. Instead, they came out wearing their costumes, which has never been done before or since. Because as we all know, with actors and actresses, they come out wearing their tuxedos and their dresses. But no, they decided they're going to come out as Power Rangers. They shook hands, they took pictures, and in their full costumes, they stepped into that concrete. And this is a huge deal because I can't even remember the last actor or actress to put their hands and feet in the concrete at the Chinese theater. In fact, most of them don't get that opportunity at all, even now. The cast recalls this moment very well, and they said it was a very special moment for them. Steve Cardenas himself said that he looked and saw Jean-Claude Van Damme with his kids standing on the sidelines, watching them and cheering for them. 
The other cast members remember seeing all kinds of other celebrities and their kids, too. They all said that it gave them a real sense of accomplishment, which I could totally understand, because here you got all these big-name celebrities coming to see you. I couldn't even possibly imagine what that must have felt like. Now, I could talk more about this, but you know what? I could never describe how it must have been like for them. You would have to watch that part of the documentary yourself, because I will not do it justice. Now, I know I say that a lot, but there's a much bigger reason as to why I cannot do it justice. And it comes down to one simple fact. I was not a part of the cast, so I am not the one to say what that felt like. And besides that fact, this is something that you need to hear from the actual cast members to really appreciate what this must have been like for them. And I will tell you this, when I watched that part of the documentary, I nearly had tears in my eyes just thinking about that. And I'm very glad that they talked about that sense of accomplishment that they got. And that had to have been something incredible, because here they are, their first movie after a TV show, and they had such a huge turnout from some of the biggest celebrities in Hollywood. Like I said before, I could not even begin to imagine what that must have felt like. And here's another interesting fact for you. The footprints and handprints that they made in the concrete are not there at the Grumman Chinese Theater. Instead, they donated them to children's hospitals around the country, which is really awesome. And even to this day, we all remember the movie. We all remember the costumes and the cast. We all remember how awesome this really was. And after 25 years, this movie is still awesome. I loved it then, and I still love it now. There has never been a Power Rangers movie this good. And I don't know if there ever will be again. Before I go, I want to thank everyone who's watching this video right now. Because this was a very special occasion for me. And it's been a great pleasure for me to make this. Because, as I'm sure you already know, I am a huge Power Rangers fan. When this movie came out, it blew my mind. It was truly one of the greatest things to come out that summer. And even now, this movie still has a special place in my heart. And now that it's been 25 years... It still amazes me that this big moment in my childhood is still loved around the world. It's gotten a lot of criticism over the years, but true fans love this movie. And even the younger generations do. If you want to see that documentary I've quoted here and there, I'll put the link below so you can find it. And if you haven't seen Mighty Morphin Power Rangers the movie, you really need to look it up. It's truly a great film. If you're a fan of Power Rangers, you must look this up. Because it has everything that a real Power Rangers fan wants out of a movie. Great action, good drama, and most importantly, the original cast. So if you ever get the time, check this movie out. Trust me, you are gonna love it. This is Movie Fan, signing off.